It's been said that complex analysis is the jewel in the crown of mathematics. But what is it that makes this subject so beautiful? Let's start from the beginning. Complex numbers first arose in the attempt to find the zeros of polynomials of one real variable. The zeros of a polynomial are the values of x for which it is equal to zero and correspond geometrically to the places where its graph intersects the x-axis. Once the roots of a polynomial are known, it's easy to write out the factorization. For example, the polynomial x squared minus 1 can be factored as the product of x minus 1 and x plus 1. But not every polynomial can be factored in terms of real numbers. And it's clear that the graph of a polynomial, even as simple as x squared plus 1, will never intersect the x-axis. But by introducing the imaginary number i, which is by definition equal to the square root of minus 1, it was found that it is possible to factor this polynomial as x minus i times x plus i. This raises the question, can every polynomial be factored in terms of real and imaginary numbers alone? It turns out that the answer to this question is yes. This is the statement of the fundamental theorem of algebra, first proven by Gauss in 1799 when he was just 22 years old and in his life he published four different proofs of this fact, which gives you a sense of how important he considered it to be. And at the end of this video, I'm going to show you a beautiful and simple proof of this incredible fact. Consider a Cartesian coordinate system in the plane, with every point P having coordinates x, y, we associate the complex number z equal to x plus i, y. This gives a one-to-one -one correspondence between the complex numbers and points of the plane, and this graphical model of the complex numbers is called the complex plane. It's also possible to use polar coordinates to represent the point P, where r is the distance between P and the origin, and theta is the angle with the x-axis. Writing out z in terms of its x and y components, factoring out r, and then applying the famous Euler formula, we arrive at the polar form of complex numbers. It's customary to denote the distance r as the absolute value of z, and it's easy to see from the Pythagorean theorem that the absolute value of z is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared. Notice that this polar representation of complex numbers makes it easy to derive the identity i is equal to e to the i pi over 2. And let's take a moment to observe that multiplication of a complex number by i corresponds to rotating the point p by 90 degrees around the origin. For example, let's see what happens when we apply multiplication by i to the point z equals 1 four times in a row. Because of the correspondence between complex numbers and points of the plane, mappings between one region of the plane and another become correspondences between complex numbers. This gives two-dimensional problems in geometry a one-dimensional character. Let's first of all consider functions which map the entire complex plane into itself. 
As a trivial example, consider the identity function f of z equals z. A more interesting example is given by the function f of z equals a times z plus b, where a and b are complex numbers. Geometrically, this function corresponds to a rotation, a scaling, and a translation. Let's show this. Consider the function f of z equals a times z alone. Writing out a and z in polar form, we see that the absolute values are multiplied, resulting in a scaling transformation, and the angles are added, resulting in a rotation. The function f of z equals z plus b is simply a translation. The functions which map the entire complex plane into itself are of two types. Those which can be continuously developed from the identity transformation, and those which cannot, corresponding to reflections about an axis. These reflections are related to the complex conjugate function z bar, which equals x minus i y. Mappings of the entire complex plane to itself, which involve reflections, are captured by the function f of z equals a times z bar plus b. Let's take a moment to appreciate that whereas the powers of i generate the finite group of rotations around the origin by 90 degrees, when we take the exponential of i times a real number, it generates an infinite group of rotations for any angle at all. The expression for an infinitesimally small rotation around the origin is 1 plus i times epsilon, where epsilon is a small real number. Imagine dividing a finite rotation by an angle t into an infinite number of infinitesimally small rotations given by the expression 1 plus i times t over n, where n is a large number. We can imagine dividing this finite rotation into a product of n infinitesimal rotations, and taking the limit as n goes to infinity, we recover the complex exponential function. We're ready to give the definition of a concept which plays a fundamental role in complex analysis. We say that the function f is complex analytic at the point z0 if the quotient shown here converges to a limit as h goes to 0. h is a complex number which is non-zero so that the quotient is well defined. The limit of the quotient when it exists, is called the derivative of f at z0. It really needs to be emphasized that in this limit, h is a complex number which can approach 0 from any direction. Let's compare this with the case of the derivative of a function of one real variable. In this case, there's only one direction to travel towards the limiting value, but in the case of complex differentiable functions, there is no restriction on how h approaches 0 in the complex plane. Let's now derive the equation which all complex differentiable functions must satisfy by computing the complex derivative in two ways. First, by pushing h towards 0 along the real axis, and then by pushing it along the imaginary axis. In order for the condition which defines complex differentiable functions to be satisfied, these two limits must be equal. Let's pause for a moment and really make sure we understand what's going on here. In the top equation, we have the complex derivative of f, but when we write out f in terms of its real and imaginary parts, the denominator is a pure real number. 
but in the bottom equation. The denominator is a pure imaginary number, and this produces a factor of 1 over i on the right-hand side, which is not present in the top equation. In order for these two limits to be equal, it's necessary that the function f satisfies this partial differential equation, which is called the Cauchy-Riemann equation. As a trivial example, it's easy to see that the constant function f of z is equal to c is complex analytic, since both sides of the Cauchy-Riemann equation are zero in this case. Now let's show that the identity function f of z equals z is complex analytic. Let f1 and f2 be two complex analytic functions. Then the sum f1 plus f2 and the product f1 times f2 are also complex analytic. This follows from the fact that the derivative is a linear operator. Combining what we've said so far is enough to prove that all polynomials are complex analytic for every point in the entire complex plane. Feel free to fill in the details in the comments. By the way, an example of a function which does not satisfy the Cauchy-Riemann equation is the complex conjugate function. So far we've only shown what happens when h approaches 0 along the real and imaginary axes. What happens if we let h approach 0 along, for example, a continuous curve? Can you see why, in order to answer this question, it's enough to know what happens to the complex derivative as h approaches 0 along the real and imaginary axes? Let me know in the comments. A parameterized curve in the plane is a mapping from a closed interval AB to the plane. If the endpoints of the curve coincide, we say that it is closed. For example, consider the parameterization of the circle e to the it for t in the closed interval from 0 to 2 pi. It's easy to see that this is a closed curve, since e to the 2 pi i equals 1. Consider an open subset of the complex plane, and let f be a function which is complex analytic for every point in this set. Then, by definition, the integral of f along a curve which lies in the set is defined by the following expression. Let's pause again and make sure we really understand what's going on here. We're going to unpack this definition and write everything out in terms of real integrals, and then compute some examples. Let's find out where this definition comes from. Given a parameterized curve equal to x of t plus i y of t, in order to capture the concept of integrating f along the curve, we form the composition of f with gamma and take the integral of f gamma d gamma between gamma a and gamma b. Then, substituting the definition of gamma into the differential d gamma, we can change the integration over to a real integral. Cleaning everything up, we arrive at the original definition. Let's consider the case that f is the constant function equal to 1. Applying the definition of the complex integral and substituting 1 for f, we arrive at the integral of d gamma from a to b. But this is just the fundamental theorem of calculus. Observe that this shows that the integral of dz around a closed curve equals 0 since the endpoints of the curve coincide. Let's consider what happens when f is the identity transformation f of z equals z. 
writing out z in terms of its real and imaginary parts, and doing the same for the differential, we see that this calculation reduces to computing four integrals. Rewriting as two integrals, and observing that x dy plus y dx is the total differential of xy, we arrive at the result. Notice that this shows the integral of z dz around a closed curve equals zero. As a final example, consider the function f of z equals 1 over z. And let's integrate dz over z along the boundary of a unit circle centered at the origin. Writing out the differential dz in terms of the curve gamma, we find that dz equals i e to the i t dt. Substituting this value for dz and gamma of t for z, canceling like terms, we arrive at the integral of dt from 0 to 2 pi, giving a final result of 2 pi i. This shows that not all complex functions yield zero when integrated along a closed curve. But although this example is very simple, it lies at the heart of complex analysis. Let gamma be a closed curve in the complex plane. And let f be a function which is complex analytic everywhere inside the region defined by gamma, as well as on the boundary. Then the integral of f along the curve equals zero. This is Cauchy's theorem. Divide the region enclosed by the curve with a grid of horizontal and vertical lines. Let's call the spacing between the grid lines h. The integral around the entire curve is equal to the sum of the integrals taken along each subregion. To see this, observe that because f is continuous, the parts of the integral in the neighboring subregions which go in opposite directions actually cancel out. The subregions created by this process are of two types, those which contain part of the curve and those which lie completely in the interior. Let's color all of the interior regions blue and anything that contains part of the curve red. It's easy to see that the length of the side of one of the squares in the inner blue region is equal to the grid spacing h. But since the spacing between the grid lines is an arbitrary choice that's made by us, we can make the side length of the blue squares as small as we want. The integral of f around the curve is equal to the sum of the integrals around the red and blue regions. Let's consider one of the integrals over the boundary of a blue square. Let z0 be the point in the complex plane corresponding to the bottom left corner of the square. Then since f is complex analytic at z0, we can rewrite f using the definition of the complex derivative. This defines a new function, nu of z, which goes to zero as z goes to z0. Let's group all the terms together in three integrals. We've already shown that the integral of dz around a closed curve is zero. We have also shown that the integral of z dz around a closed curve is zero. As for the final term, since we can make the side length of the square as small as we like, when we take the limit as h goes to zero, we see that the only possible value for the integral to have is zero. Let's now turn our attention to the integral of f over red regions which contain part of the curve. Let's first consider the case that gamma is a curve that describes the boundary of a shape made out of squares. In that case, 
All of the steps from our previous argument are still valid, and we can prove Cauchy's theorem for this type of curve. What we will do for the more general case is continue decreasing the spacing between the grid lines h, approximating the curve gamma with smaller and smaller squares, until in the limit that h goes to zero, the boundary of the shape formed by the little squares goes over into the curve. Consider a closed curve gamma, and let A be a point inside the region bounded by the curve. Let F be a function which is complex analytic everywhere inside the region and on the boundary, except at the point A. Then the result of integrating F along gamma will be the same as the result of integrating F along any other smaller closed curve lying within the region which also contains A. To begin, draw a small circle of radius epsilon around A, and draw the line connecting this circle to gamma. We're going to integrate F along this path. The parts of the path going in opposite directions along the line cancel out when we integrate, leaving two integrals, one on gamma and the other on the inner circle which is taken in the opposite sense. But since F is complex analytic everywhere, both in this region and on the boundary, by Cauchy's theorem, the integral along this path is equal to zero. And since the choice of a circle or the radius epsilon was arbitrary, this shows that the integral of f along gamma will give the same result as integrating f along any other closed curve which also lies in the region and contains the point A. If f is a function which is complex analytic everywhere on and within a curve gamma, then the function f over z minus a is complex analytic everywhere on and within gamma except at the point a. As we have just shown, integrating this expression over gamma will give the same result as integrating it along any other closed curve which contains a and lies within this region. Let's choose a circle centered at a with radius epsilon, and consider the limit as epsilon goes to zero. To evaluate this integral, we rewrite the expression under the integral sign by adding and subtracting f of a over z minus a. Notice that the first term on the right hand side is complex analytic everywhere on and within gamma, since the top and bottom both go to zero as z goes to a. So by Cauchy's theorem, this part of the integral vanishes. This shows the remarkable result that the value of a complex analytic function at any point can be expressed as an integral taken along a curve enclosing the point. This is Cauchy's integral formula. Consider an open subset of the complex plane, and let f be a function which is complex analytic for all points inside this set. Let z0 be a point lying in the set, and consider a small circle of radius r centered around z0. Then the function f can be expanded in a power series which converges in a disk centered around z0 and lies within the circle. The coefficients of the power series, a n, are equal to n factorial times the nth derivative of f, and the nth derivative of f can be expressed by the explicit formula shown here.
Let's assume that it was possible to write f in terms of a power series. Then the second part of the theorem can be proved by differentiating the series term by term, as we will now show. Plugging z0 into the series, we find that f at z0 equals a0. We can take the first derivative of the series, and plugging in z0 to the derivative, the only term which survives is the coefficient a1. Differentiating again, we find that the second derivative of f at z0 equals 2 times a2. And continuing in this manner, it's clear that the nth derivative of f at z0 will equal n factorial times a n. To prove that the function f can be written as a power series, we're going to use a very sneaky trick to expand the denominator in Cauchy's integral formula using a geometric series. Let's carry out this calculation now. Can you see what restrictions must be placed on the radius of the disk where the series converges in order for this step of the calculation to be valid? Let me know in the comments. Combining what we've said so far, we have found an expression for a n, but since the nth derivative of f equals n factorial times a n, we can multiply this expression by n factorial to arrive at an explicit formula for the nth derivative of f in terms of an integral of f around a closed curve. Let f be a function which is complex analytic for every point in the entire complex plane. And let m be a number such that the absolute value of f at any point is always less than m. Then f is constant. This is Louisville's theorem. Since f is complex analytic in the entire complex plane, we can expand it in a power series around the origin. Write out the explicit formula for the coefficients and calculate them directly. Let's take our path of integration to be a circle of radius r. Then substituting this path for z in the integral, and using the assumption that the absolute value of f is bounded by m, we find that a n is less than m over r to the n. So taking the limit as r goes to infinity, we see that all of the coefficients in the power series expansion are zero except for the first term, which is constant. We can now prove the following theorem. A non-constant polynomial p of z with complex coefficients has at least one complex zero. We can prove this by contradiction. Assume p never equals zero. Then 1 over p would be a bounded complex analytic function in the entire complex plane which by Louisville's theorem implies 1 over p is constant, contradicting the assumption that p is non-constant. We are now ready to prove the fundamental theorem of algebra. By the previous theorem, we can find a zero of p. It's possible to rewrite p as a polynomial in z minus z1 by changing variables from z to z minus z1 plus z1. 
writing out this polynomial, we find a new set of coefficients, b1 through bn. We can see that b0 equals 0 since p of z1 equals 0. Therefore, we can factor z minus z1 out of p, finding a new polynomial q of degree n minus 1. And continuing this process, we prove the theorem by induction. Although the definition of the derivative of a function of a complex variable mimics the definition for the derivative of a function of a real variable, complex analytic functions satisfy much stronger properties than functions of a real variable which possess only a single derivative. We have seen that the condition that a function possesses a single complex derivative implies it possesses an infinite number of derivatives, which is not the case for functions of a real variable and functions which are complex analytic in the entire complex plane satisfy very strong properties. We've just caught a glimpse of the way these types of functions' growth are controlled by their zeros and have only just begun to scratch the surface of the beautiful subject of complex analysis. See you next time.